Well, <clears throat> immediately on landing, we went up to a, uh, a replacement depot that the 5th Army had set up to bring all the uh, replacement troops into Italy and from there then to transfer them to uh, individual divisions and so forth. Uh, the, uh, the, the quarters there were, were pretty nice. Uh, we were living in, in tents. I think they slept, they slept either uh, uh, 16 or 18 men in them. And uh, we, we had our duffel bags that uh, were, were, was the lifeblood of, uh, <laughs> of the Army. Because uh, once you went, went on the line, you, you had, when you were off the line, you had this duffel bag, which was a big over-the-shoulder bag had clean clothing in it, uh, anything that you wanted to keep in it uh, or that you were allowed to keep in it. Um, and uh, then once you went into action, they would, uh, you'd pack, pack your duffel bag and they'd pick it up and they'd haul it back someplace. And amazingly, we always got them back, uh, which always amazed me. Uh, but while we were in the replacement depot, uh, it was a, uh, just a chance to get back in shape after being on the on board ship for so long. Uh, a lot of marches started out with 10, 10 um, mile walks, uh, hikes, uh, and with full field packs. And eventually, uh, because we were there so long, we got into 25 mile uh, a pack uh, uh, walks, but uh, the the interesting thing was that we uh, all the infantry guys were assigned a part of the camp. All the guys who had uh, BAR training have, were assigned to a, an individual uh, part part of the park. Uh, those that had mortar training, those that had fi uh, 57 or 37 millimeter anti-tank gunning like ourselves with other places and so forth. So all, uh, all of a sudden I came in contact with guys that I had never met. None of the ones that I trained with back in South Carolina ended up with me after the I mean after our trip overseas. Don't know what, what happened. They were probably somewhere else in in the uh, in the, can in the replacement depot there, but uh, that was me. So I, I met a bunch of new guys. Uh, one guy that I came, became very close friends with, uh, probably the oldest guy I knew, Smitty was about uh, 24, 25, was married, had a son. He wrote to his wife every day. She wrote to him every day. And uh, later on, as we got up and then to battle, when we, whenever we got mail, why well, he would always have five or six letters waiting for him, usually with pictures of his wife and son and so forth. Uh, but Smitty had trained somewhere in the States on 57s uh, and 37s. And we just uh, sort of became uh, pretty good friends. Uh, they say basically what we were doing, we, we was all pretty much basic training all over again. Uh, only they called it a refresher. Uh, we had to keep in shape we didn't, when we were going out. But the interesting thing was that they would bring replacements in, particularly infantrymen, and uh, they would be there three or four days, long enough to get clean uniform, a couple of good meals. Uh, and then they would be uh, transferred to uh, a division somewhere in mm -hmm. Italy. Uh, the guys in this uh, area that had the uh, anti-tank gunners, uh, we sat there, we were there a week, or second week, third week, what's going on? The other guys were coming in, going out like, you can't believe. And so, uh, the, the explanation was that they were using 
They were used, Germans were using tanks, so were we, but not like they were using them in Europe. So there was not the demand for replacement uh, anti-tank gunners like there were for infantry guys or PAR guys mm -hmm. or motor guys or anything like that. So we just stayed there until they were, uh, and, and this, we, we stayed there about a month. And uh, all these other guys had, had gone into action. Finally, on uh, uh, Easter night, uh, we got uh, a, a number of us in that uh, tent, got us uh, word that, well, before that, uh, they finally took all of us out and gave us three days of training on a BAR, which is the most high-powered weapon in a infantry uh, litter or infantry squad. Uh, you don't want to be a BAR man. It's the first guy the Germans went for because he had as much power in that one weapon as all the other guys d did in there in the, in the squad with a M1, our carbine. And so we had three days and we had to learn how to uh, field strip uh, a machine gun, uh, BAR, which meant we had to tear it down in the dark, be able to replace springs or whatever, uh, put in a new firing pin, put it back together in the dark, because you never knew where you were going to be uh, when it might happen to you. Uh, after three days of that, uh, we got our assignment, and uh, as I say, it was on uh, Easter Eve night, Saturday night, we were uh, taken into Naples uh, and put on destroyer escorts, and they were going to make the short haul of 100 miles or so from uh, Naples up to uh, uh, Anzio. And, uh, while we were on, on that ship, every guy got interviewed and was told, you're going to go to this division or that division, so on. Uh, my friend Smitty somehow, as got before R, but anyway, uh, he was interviewed, and he came back out of his interview, and he said, well, I'm going to the 339th Infantry Division of the 85th Division. I'm going as a litter bearer. He said, you ever had any first aid experience? And he had been in private life uh, an insurance adjuster for some insurance company in Chicago. And I said, no other than a little bit of first aid I got in Boy Scouts. He said, tell them about that. He said, they apparently need litter bearers. And he said, that's what I'm going to be. He said, that's better than being a BAR guy. So when I got called in, a uh, very nice second lieutenant went over and he said, well, he's looking at my file. And they, they, they did look at the file. Yeah, we don't need any anti-tank guys. We don't need any uh, Jeep drivers you can drive. We don't need any uh, one-quarter ton trucks drivers, you, uh, which you can do. Uh, you ever had any first aid experience? And I said, well, yeah, I've had some experience in Boy Scouts and uh, wrapping up. He said, how would you like to be a, a litter bearer? I, I don't know. What's a litter bearer do? <laughs> and uh, he, he says, they'll teach you everything you know <laughs> and, and need to know. And so that's how I got transferred uh, from a BAR man uh, which was almost instant death in an infantry company because I was going to an infantry uh, division and an infantry company. And, of course, the BAR guys were then spread into an infantry squad, which meant they were on the as front line as you could get. And uh, so uh, we landed on Anzio, they were just actually mopping up there. Uh, Anzio had been a, a real mess. Uh, horrible casualties there uh, over the course of from January till uh, April. And uh, 
From there, I was uh, well, uh, transferred to the 85th of, or to the 339th. Uh, at this point, my memory's a little vague in that I don't remember how I got there, whether we walked, whether we went on trucks. It was, it was way south of Rome, uh, and it was down where they were fighting in the Gustav line. Uh, and in the mountains, and where uh, Anzio, or not Anzio, the uh, Mount Casino, the uh, mountain that, uh, and uh, the uh, casino that, we, or the abbey that was there, uh, was, was controlled by the Germans. It was on a mountain about 5,000 feet high. That complete view of the whole valley looking south of there in any way that you could. The, the Allies had tried all w winter uh, to, to break that line. When, when we went out to pick up wounded out among the infantry guys who were on the front line, we would bring them back to the aid station. They would be, if able, they'd be patched up taken back to an evac hospital, which, if you recall, the days of MASH was what that was, an evac hospital and, and field hospital. From the evac hospital, which is where they got them out of there, then they'd take them back to field hospital where they would actually operate on. Uh, uh, so once the Americans, uh, the Allies, broke a, a defensive line and pushed them out, they would not just go back another couple of miles and take them. They might pull back 20 miles and to where there was another defensive line. Mm -hmm. In this case, after the Gustav line, they, uh, the next big holding position was south of Rome. And the uh, Allies, and the British troops, Polish troops, Canadian, U.S., once they broke through that uh, mountain and captured that hill, uh, they just pushed the Germans back. And we were going so fast that the, the good defensive line that they had in Rome was, was broken pretty quickly. We got through it because there were a couple of pretty good roads that went up from down in the southern part up into to Rome. Italy did not have a lot of good roads, uh, be, primarily because of the mountains. <coughs> Excuse me. And so uh, we, we, we pushed the Germans back to, uh, to Rome. And on June uh, 4th, uh, entered Rome. And uh, our, my division was, uh, on the, the second day, we went through Rome marched through Rome in two days, a huge city. Uh, of course, we were all on foot, and probably from, from the south end of Rome to the north end of Rome was probably 30, 35 miles, I don't know. Uh, but we, uh, as we, as we entered Rome that morning, and that it always amazed me where the people all of a sudden, uh, half of the people were, were waving American flags. Where they got them, I have no idea. Uh, the, the guys would come out with their bottles of Italian vino and uh, want you to take a drink. The uh, old ladies, the young ladies, particularly the young ladies, would come out and, and hug us and kiss us, and the kids would be running after us. Hey, Joe, Chocolato. Hey, Joe, Chocolato. That was about the only words they really knew. Uh, and if we had any candy, we, and that's why the little kids always thought American troops were so great. Uh, I used to, uh, uh, on through, through Italy and so forth, uh, struck up some fond acquaintances with uh, some, some kids and, that I would give chocolate to and and uh, chewing gum, they thought, was the most marvelous thing in the world. They did not have chewing gum in Italy. Uh, and so 
going through Rome was quite an experience for a uh, now 19-year-old, because uh, I turned 19 in February just before I, uh, well, when I was home, uh, before on my pass. Uh, we uh, went hiking through, or just walking through, but uh, in the, the first night we, we found a park and they told us to bivouac there and we pitched our uh, pup tents there, stayed there overnight, finished marching through Rome the next day, same thing all over, uh, people just celebrating the, the entrance of the American troops. And uh, we went up, oh, I guess probably 20, 25 miles north of Rome. And uh, we, we were told that we were going to be taken off the line uh, because we'd been on the line something like 60 some days. Uh, from the, some of them before I had gotten to them. And they took us to a place called Lido di Roma, which was a resort off of the, uh, out of Rome, uh, on the Mediterranean Sea. And uh, so we had three or four days there. The USO brought in a couple of shows for us to entertain us. Uh, we got clean clothes, uh, some good food for three or four days, and, uh, and spent, I think, about four days off the line. And then it was back to the war. Mm -hmm. uh, they loaded us up in trucks and took us up and re relieved the, di the division that had relieved us. And so it was just a continuation of the uh, uh, war up, uh, going up through Italy. Once the, the, the Allies uh, did the bat battle uh, on Normandy in uh, June of 45, 44, excuse me, uh, we became, as they called here, the Forgotten Front, because whereas we had about 20 German divisions in Italy, uh, 15, 16 American divisions, and then when they were getting ready for that to make the invasion, they pulled two or three of the best divisions in Italy, 34th, uh, 36th, uh, 45th, I think it was, and, and took them uh, to, to England and, and they went in and the invasion there. So we, and they brought some new divisions from all selective service from the United States and without any battle experience. And so there were some pretty exciting events that went on during that period while those troops got indoctrinated and so forth. So we ended the, the winter of 45 from about November till January, I think it was, uh, in a, in a uh, holding pattern. And uh, we dug in, the Germans were dug in, the Po River was right in front of us, between us, and uh, we, uh, they, f they felt we didn't have the, the troops, the equipment to try and, and battle through the, through the winter in the mountains. And this was, this, these were all mountains. Every, every one of them had a hill number. Uh, my, uh, uh, my memory uh, is, is not that, I never got involved in a lot of names of towns We'd, we'd take a town, we'd go through it. Okay, I knew what it was today. Tomorrow I forgot all about it. I had one of my friends that uh, uh, I think he, well, he, and Smitty was one too, that although you weren't supposed to keep a diary, he did. And uh, if you were to sit down with my friend Smitty, who just died six months ago, he could probably tell you every town we were ever in because he had them written down. Uh, I couldn't remember. I could remember, associate things there. But uh, it, uh, I thought I'm never coming back here again. <laughs> what do I care? <laughs> uh, but, uh, 
But we stayed in a, a holding action all winter long. We had, uh, we dug in and we had a, had a bunker and the, uh, it would almost have taken a bomb except right on top of us. It was built into a, a hillside. Uh, it was big enough, we had four that slept in it. Uh, we it was uh, we had sandbags on one side of it or part of it where we crawled into it. The only thing that was tentative was the was the roof, which just was old branches and leaves and sticks and stuff like that on top of it, which wouldn't have stopped a, an artillery shell. But uh, uh, other than that, we were pretty well protected. And we lived there for the winter. We got. They brought up uh, hot food for us. Everything that we received, medical supplies, food, water, fuel for the vehicles, mm. came up in mule trains. The Italians in the southern part from Rome down were uh, pretty favorably inclined to the Americans and really uh, cheered and, and won us the, there. From Rome on up, and particularly in Bologna and Milan, uh, they were very, very strong backers of the Germans in most cases. And uh, when when we would capture some of those towns and cities, you could tell they didn't like us. Uh, it was not the same exuberance that we had received in, in Rome and places like that. And that was primarily from Bologna all up to Venice. Uh, and in the, the winter that we were in the, in this bunker, we had very few calls. I mean, most of the time we just sat around. Uh, I mean, it, it was very interesting. It, it, I don't know how the days went. Uh, we would help out the aid station if they had wounded there that they were caring for. Sometimes when we would bring them back, we'd pick a guy up who had been wounded. He wasn't that bad. In fact, when I was wounded, uh, I was able to stay on full duty because I just got some shrapnel in my uh, uh, left arm. And uh, it, it, I was able to keep going uh, every, every day. Some guys uh, would maybe be out for two or three days, but we would help them, uh, some of them help feed them, give them their shots, whatever they, they needed. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, most of the action uh, happened at nighttime when we would send patrols out to, to uh, try and get readings on what the Germans were doing. They did the same thing to us. Uh, and uh, there would be mortar attacks and machine gun fire, and uh, it would be like usually the late morning, the late nighttime, early morning, we'd, we'd get a call that say, hey, we were on patrol last night. We lost a man or we lost two guys. Uh, we know one's dead. The others we think is still alive. Can you go get them? And uh, we would. Uh, we were never supposed to go out in front of the uh, uh, infantry. That was part of the Geneva Rules. And we used to to uh, to volunteer because a lot of these where they went were particularly. Uh, got caught in a mortar attack or something the night before, uh, and they didn't know how bad they were, uh, they would ask, do we have any volunteers to go see if you can find this? We, we weren't very smart, I guess, or just thought nothing could happen to us, as uh, young people often do. And we, we would volunteer to go. And uh, as a result of doing some of those, uh, in that winter, I received a bronze star uh, from, I don't know what it reads, meritorious service above beyond the call of duty, something like that. Uh, 
also got wounded at the same time. But uh, we would go out <clears throat> and try and find guys and bring them back. And I had some unique experiences on those, on those runs. One that I remember very vividly was we were called up. Remember, the battalion aid station is back maybe 500 yards from the, where the guys are on the mountain. Of Europe. And we were called up to where the company but, uh, commander had his uh, headquarters and told about this, but he said, there's a sniper out there. We've got to clear him out before you, we want you guys to go out and see if you can find him. Uh, so I'm sitting dead down between the two of them, and we're talking. And uh, I turned to the guy to my left to say something to him. There was a shot. I didn't think anything about it for a minute. And all of a sudden, the guy on my right slumped against my shoulder. And I turned, and he was dead. He'd been shot right through the, uh, the uh, and he had, he had laid his helmet down beside him. I think we all had, although I'm not sure I did, because I often thought afterwards, was he really shooting at my Red Cross great target? <laughs> Was he really shooting at me? And he was off a little bit and hit the guy here. But it, it, that just happened that quickly. Uh, didn't really know the guy, uh, but uh, it was one, one of those situations. Another time, we received a call that they had been out on a, uh, and this were, they were getting ready to try and cross the uh, Po River, which they were going to, do in pontoon boats in the, uh, the spring, and the, you know the river was running pretty high, uh, pretty dangerous crossing. But they had uh, been doing some uh, patrolling and got caught, and uh, we were asked for volunteers, and our, our squad said we'll go. And we're, there's the four of us. And, one guy's got the litter over his shoulder. I'm leading away, and we're just a single Indian file walking along the side of this mountain. On this mountain here are American troops, probably a couple of hundred troops, a whole company of guys. They're up there. They're firing at the Germans on this mountain over here. It was that close that they could fire, they could see each other. As we came around the corner, I could look over and I could see Germans on this hillside. And, you know, there's all, all kinds of fire, uh, rifles, machine guns, uh, going back and forth. And we stepped in front, and all of a sudden the guys up on the American side just stopped shooting. It within a minute or so, I would say. The Germans on the German side stopped shooting. There wasn't a sound in that valley uh, between those two armies. We went out, found, went quite a ways out. But in fact, we were closer to the German lines than we were to our own lines found a guy, he was in a mortar, had been uh, wounded in a mortar attack the night before. He was in a, a big mortar hole, which makes a pretty good hole. He was uh, delirious. He had lost uh, this whole hand, two or three fingers on his right hand, and he was muttering, what did I do? What did I do? That's all he... We had to, he was, uh, as I say, delirious. We had to strap him on the litter and start back with this guy. There isn't a sound. We went back, and I'm saying, I don't know how far, but could have been 100 yards, 150, I don't know. But we got where we were completely out of sight 
around the mountain, and there was a path along here and the mountain here. And all of a sudden, all hell broke loose. The war started all over again. And the, the, the Americans are firing, the Germans are firing. But there wasn't a shot fired. When, uh, and, uh, and, and that uh, that's something I'll never forget. Uh, one other similar situation we were going out to uh, to pick up a guy that we we knew was out there somewhere we never did find him but we we come from back of where we were and uh, uh, going going up through this valley all of a sudden there's a, a, a dug out into a mountainside. There's a German soldier standing there with a rifle. I came around uh, the, the corner and my other three guys are with me. And I, I just held up my hand like that. This guy, the German, looked at me. I thought he was going to shoot us all. He was as scared as we were. We turned and ran. We, of course, when we got back a little ways, we told some American soldiers, there's a guy up there in that, that bunker up there. They went up, he was gone. He'd, he'd run too. <laughs> <laughs> but that was, you know, that was one of the funny kind of things that happened. We had one squad of, of four guys that uh, all of us young. Uh, 18, 19, 20, uh, who I won't say didn't care because obviously we cared a heck of a lot, but just felt that nothing was going to happen to us. And so it was our job to go do that. Uh, we don't want anybody else to do it. And we don't want anybody to volunteer. We'll do it because we'll be back. Uh, I think that's how we felt. I don't know if we ever expressed that. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, I think it's, it's certainly how I, um, how I felt about it at, at the time. Um, the, the, going back a little, when I first was assigned to the 85th and to the 339th Regiment, we didn't know it at the time, and when Smitty told me, you know, see if you can get in the medics. We didn't know it until we got to the to the regiment, to the aid station, that uh, they had had, because when they were at full complement, they had four litter squads of four guys, 16 guys. We didn't know that the reason we had been uh, accepted was they had had a higher percentage of casualties among the medics than they had had among infantry guys. Hard to believe, but it was true. When Smitty and I, and I guess a couple of other guys came up, they took us back from two squads back to the four that they were supposed to have. So, you know, when they had four squads, they had a lot of casualties in a day. Mm -hmm. uh, Within five days of after we joined up, we were back to eight guys. We had lost eight guys. Not, uh, only one that I know that was killed, but seven others that were wounded, eight of them all told, but were taken out of commission and weren't, weren't able to perform. And so, uh, it wasn't like we were sitting back there, way in the back lines, uh, and, and we're safe. Uh, one other uh, incident that I think you might enjoy, uh, we used to, along the Po River, and particularly in the, uh, in the wintertime, and when the, in February when they were getting ready to, to cross the Po, uh, and move on up through uh, uh, northern Italy. Uh, we got a lot of fog every night. We'd get calls out. And uh, I can remember one night, I don't know what the occasion was, but we were to go out to pick up a guy. 
it was so foggy and we were going to be able to take a jeep part way we had a jeep assigned to our battalion and a driver that mm -hmm. did nothing but drove that jeep uh, he was he was driving i was sitting on the front fender and another guy was sitting on the right fender and we're whispering back to him turn it right turn it left straight ahead because you couldn't do it any louder than you could hear germans on the other side of the river talking uh and, and they could hear us so it was very but we went i don't know how far we went like that but the fog was that dense that you just literally could not see anything and uh uh, we got him so far, then we were able to take our squad and go up and pick the guy up, bring mm -hmm. him back. And, and of course, when we brought him back on a Jeep, we put him on the, uh, the racks on, on the Jeep that we uh, could bring bring them back. But, uh, you know, that was just, that was, a, that was a different kind of thing that happened. Yeah. yeah. Last hundred miles of Italy, it, we were fighting defeated troops. The Germans were throwing down their arms. They were leaving ammunition. Uh, one of our uh, companies in the 339th uh, captured uh, a, um, actually were behind the German lines, captured a, a, a bakery where they were making bakery. And, and our guys had all this hot bread <laughs> that they were able to share with their buddies. Because they, uh, the Germans just ran away at the, uh, and left it, but the uh, the the last month or so in, in the uh, war ended in Italy on uh, May second, I think. Uh, the w we were just, we were moving faster than we could get than the, uh, they could keep up with. It was tough to get uh, uh, fuel to us because the trucks were running out of fuel. Uh, I mean, they were doing 20 and 30 miles a day, and the, and the Germans were just throwing down their arms. Uh, when the the day that the war ended in Italy, uh, the uh, our our uh, battalion uh, blocked off. There was a road that went up through the Brenner Pass from Italy into Austria, and they blocked that road, and. The, there literally were thousands of German troops that surrendered uh, to our troops uh, in in that area because they couldn't get through to, to escape back to Austria and, and into Germany. Uh, for probably a week, the week about the time the war was over in Italy, a week afterwards. I was probably around more Germans than I was Americans. I mean, they were just uh, uh, surrendering by the thousands, throwing down their arms. Uh, all they wanted to do was leave and get home. And uh, so you, you would see a couple hundred Germans with maybe a half a dozen GIs guarding them. Uh, it was... Uh, I mean, after the, the, the fierce battles that uh, had been waged all through Italy, uh, it was just amazing. And these were, these were pretty crack troops that, uh, that were surrendering, but they had come to the conclusion that the war was over. And uh, of course, they, uh, uh, it ended about a week later in, in Europe. Uh, but... Uh, the that part of it uh, wrapped up very very quickly in, in Italy. We of course were made aware of when when Mussolini and his, uh, his girlfriend were uh, hung in um, um, in northern Italy. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, we and uh, uh, the the Germans tried to. Uh, uh, get his body and take it back to uh, Germany because uh, Hitler had been uh, had really taken care of Mussolini through all the, all the time. Uh, 
the Italians were uh, generally were not considered as, as uh, good troops, and probably because uh, they were f fighting for something that they, they weren't really sold on. The, the German people were fanatic about Hitler and Germany and so on. The, the uh, Italian people knew that uh, that uh, uh, the the Germans were using them and uh, were mistreating them, and they, they uh, finally finally wised up to it. I guess. I mean, the army took things that uh, you know they had no right to. They just took over a uh, it had been a, a, a school. A uh, private academy of some kind in Trieste had a, a beautiful swimming pool, a, f a track, uh, volleyball courts, uh, and and we we started playing. We got together a team, started playing volleyball, and got pretty darn good. And we traveled all over uh, Italy and Yugoslavia uh, for the summer of '45. Playing volleyball and having a ball. <laughs> uh, we used to once a week. We had a dance out at the school, and uh, uh, gals from the from the town would come in, and uh, we'd have an army band. Uh, at the uh, at the same time, uh, there was a a place. Uh, not in Yugoslavia, and I don't remember the name of the town, where they had, uh, every summer for centuries, had had outdoor operas. And the commander of our, our group was quite an opera fan. So he once asked me if I would drive him to wherever this town was. Uh, he, they were doing Carmen, and he wanted to see Carmen. And uh, so here's this still eight or 19 year old kid, didn't know what the first thing about an opera was, but I drove him. It was all sung in Italian. Uh, I dropped him off. He of course had nice uh, seats. I was up in the, the back of the, the, uh, the outdoor arena, but I really got to enjoy it. And so I went, uh, Drove him to three or four, uh, went to Aida, uh, 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 a couple, couple other operas that uh, we went to to see, and uh, uh, that was that was that was pretty sharp. <laughs> Getting to do that. <laughs> Did you ever have like any instances like when you were like on the front line? And maybe you've already shared with, with, with a couple of these, but you ever feel like there was an instance where like something happened and you just felt like like God intervened, or you know, like you felt like there was a greater power that influenced like an event? Yeah, certainly. Uh, that time we went out to pick up uh, the guy, and the, the two armies stopped fighting was certainly a time like that. Even though we thought we were invincible, uh, we knew it wasn't us that uh, uh, did that. And at the time, I scared this guy in the, in the uh, bunker <laughs> and uh, scared him and sc he scared me. Uh, I would say those both were certainly times that, mm -hmm. and again, the, the time that I had that uh, experience of having a guy shot right next to me uh, that uh, I didn't get over that right away mm -hmm. I, I thought about that a lot because so many times I thought about could that guy have been shooting you know these are snipers shot from quite far away and uh, could even just his windage been off a little bit and, Mm -hmm. And hit this other guy instead of me. And do you think that like they were you know, targeting medics? Um, no, I, I don't. I don't think so. Uh, in, in that sniper situation, I mean, who who knows what? But I mean, uh, 
maybe if I hadn't been sitting there with a helmet on and uh, with a white cr a red cross and a white background, uh, might never have thought of that. Uh, but uh, I, you know, certainly the the, the time that they they spared our lives certainly because those Germans when we went around to pick up this guy they could have dropped a couple of mortars on us so easy uh, but when the Americans stopped firing they stopped firing and it was like something's gonna happen and then <laughs> we happened <laughs> mm -hmm. that guy that you picked up did he end up making it no we got him back to the aid station and, and we and I think he affected us more than probably any guy that we had ever picked up because you know he was delirious, and I can still I mean all all he could repeat was just over and over what did I do what did I do? Uh, we got him back to the aid station. They gave him several pints of plasma, uh, rushed him back to the evacuation hospital, and uh, we heard that. Uh, he died back in the back, and we never even got back to the field hospital. But he had lost so much blood from, he'd, they'd been out on that patrol that night, it was mid-afternoon, I think, when we, the, the maggots actually started eating in his hands, where it was just skin and stuff. Mm -hmm. and, uh, you know. and the medics were a very tight-knit group. And when we came off a pass, or went back to get uh, uh, get a break for a couple of days, get uh, clean uniforms, a shower, which after a week's time really felt pretty good. Uh, I can remember there were times uh, in 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 the mountains when more than once where we lived in the same clothes for thirty or forty days without a shower. I mean, there was just no way to do it. Everything was coming up by mules. Uh, and uh, uh, you, <laughs> you smelt, but so did your, so did your buddies. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I guess you didn't really smell them anymore. The, the medics attached to every company. Excuse me. Uh, those guys were very prone to get, getting wounded or killed. And I would say that almost every one of those guys that I got to know, and it was only because we brought them back from being wounded to the aid station and maybe they might stay there a day or so. Mm -hmm. These They were sort of our fellow buddies because they were medics. Uh, I got to know some of those guys and, uh, uh, but as I say, I really didn't uh, know uh, in, any of the infantry guys uh, by name as such. Yeah. You know, but your, your, your medic friends, though, the guys that you made these calls with, I mean, was there any time where, like, when you guys were on your way back and, and you know, they didn't make it, but you did? Uh, couple times, yeah. Uh, do, you, had, do you remember had, their names? Uh, yeah, one, one was a guy by the name of Bob Spicel, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, they, we got caught in a mortar barrage, and, and, uh, we, and the first thing we did was get the guy that we had on the litter back. He couldn't help. He was wounded, and and we uh, got the guy that we were carrying back, and I don't know whether we went out and got him or they sent another squad out, out for him. At the, and uh, at, again, at the reunions, uh, we had two or three medics that showed up at different reunions, uh, mostly uh, uh, guys that had been uh, company, company medics. Mm -hmm. And almost all of those <clears throat> uh, had ended up getting one or two Purple Hearts, maybe a Bronze Star. Mm -hmm. We we were just evacuating a guy, and uh, all of a sudden they started throwing 
throwing mortars in at us and uh, we hit the dirt and uh, just dropped a litter right where we were and, uh, and all got as close to the ground as we could and all of a sudden I looked up and uh, there's blood running down my arm and what's this? And uh, I realized there were pieces of shrapnel. I have never played up my uh, Purple Heart, uh, even though I was wounded and was very fortunate that I could still say, stay in, in action. Uh, I never felt that I deserved the same respect that a guy who went through something a lot worse and got really hurt and hospitalized and you know a lot of these guys would would get wounded uh, be sent back to the field hospital and might spend two or three months in a hospital and come back to their unit uh, if they were at a lot of them I, I can't say a lot of them because I really didn't know them, but many guys would uh, uh, get hurt that bad and either, you know, if they lost an arm or a leg or something like that, I mean, that was their ticket home. And, uh, mm -hmm. they, but if they were held that long in a field hospital, it was because they thought they might be able to, to, uh, uh, to get back. And many of them, that's all they wanted to do was to get back. Right. Uh, you've probably seen the famous scene in the Patton movie where he, kids in there because he can't take it anymore and Pat blows his stack and uh, but uh, the interesting we had two of our medical doctors in the period that I was with mm -hmm. that uh, were recalled because of uh, 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 the, the battle fatigue as they called it and, uh, you know, you wouldn't think a doctor back, sure he's treating the wounded, but he wasn't exposed to it. But uh, we, we, got, we got lots of attacks, uh, certainly nothing like the guys on the line, the, in, uh, the infantry guys. But, uh, you know, if there was, as I told you, if there was a barn or a, a farmhouse or something, that's where, where it became a, our aid station as well as a battalion station. And of course, the Germans knew we were in there, and so they would put artillery on it and, and uh, mortars and so forth. And so uh, we we got shelled quite a bit, not not nearly like we. I I have this, this theory that so many of my guys uh, my age uh, are uh, and and younger who've been in the Korea and the Vietnam War, but. Uh, that lose their hearing, and and I feel that in my case, as many, it has to do with the shelling, and because you're around it sometimes, 24 hours a day. I mean, it's mm -hmm. just just constant, and uh, uh, you could feel the, con the concussion at, at times, uh, depending on how close the shell landed. And um, I, I've, I've often thought that uh, uh, my hearing and, and those of many, many more of us uh, was a result of what we, mm -hmm. we heard. We had a lot of respect for the German soldiers. Uh, they were well trained, and of course, the the ones that were in Italy were some of the prime troops. And uh, uh, they, they fought, as, and, and they had two, two excellent generals, and uh, General Kessering, who was in charge of all German troops, and then Rommel, who had been in North Africa, and then, and then uh, it was Rommel who, who built, uh, was responsible for building some of those defense lines in Italy. Uh, he was a, a great tactician, and uh, I, I think 
we respected them very, very, very much. Uh, when they knew the war was over, a lot of them uh, weren't ready to give up and didn't give up, whereas others, uh, and, and probably were some of the, the newer troops maybe, and of course in near the end of the war, you know, they were sending 13, 14 year old kids to fight the Russians and, and uh, they, uh, in a couple of the later battles uh, in Italy when, when they, we were rushing through the uh, uh, northern part of Italy, uh, and they, they were capturing so many Germans. A lot of those were guys, uh, 40s and 50s, because they had run out of, because the Russians took a tremendous toll of Russian uh, or German soldiers as did we, but uh, they uh, just wasn't an endless uh, group of people that they could, uh, they had used them all. The, your bronze star that you received, was that in this, the same, you said you got that, while you got your Purple Heart, that that act, that... Uh, I, I, like, I got the, the bronze star when, and usually we'd come back off the line for uh, uh, a few days and get mm -hmm. to freshened up and some good food and stuff. Uh, they would always have an awards presentation. And uh, I got the Bronze Star in the fall after that uh, push in the Gustav line. And so many pickups and, and so many of them that were above and beyond. And uh, that, that's the way this, I don't know how it exactly reads, but it's for meritorious service above me on the call of duty. I did not even know I had been put in for the Purple Heart. And when I was awarded that, you know, I think in February of 45, uh, I was, was quite surprised. It gave me five extra points, <laughs> and I was happy for that. But as I say, I have never treated it uh, when I hear a guy has a purple heart and uh, hear anything about it, I, I just have so much respect for those guys because I, I didn't suffer to get mine, I guess is the best way to say it. Sure, it was an inconvenience, darned inconvenient, uh, but uh, it, wasn't, it wasn't the same thing. I wrote to probably... 15, 16 girls. And whenever we'd get a mail call, and, and you never got mail on the front lines, but if you came back, and we might not have had a mail for a month. And there would all, I would always get either the biggest package of, because they, they timed together, any for Frank Ruth, uh, certain PO box number. Uh, and it, the only one that ever got close to me was Smitty because his wife wrote every day. And, uh, but he used to kid me, you know, which one's that from? Uh, but I, and as I say, there, there was nothing serious between any of us, but I enjoyed writing to them. And, and uh, I guess that's the only thing we had to do mm -hmm. was when you didn't have uh, that opportunity uh, to, to be doing anything else, you, you take a piece of, and then we have what we call V mail, which was, uh, have you ever seen a V mail? Uh, -uh. uh it was a special, uh, the early days of electronic, I guess. But it was just a little thing, it was, was photoed, they sent it overseas on microfilm, and then printed it out. And it was delivered to, to soldiers at various. It always amazed me how those post office guys, in a, and the post office were guys in the service. I mean, they were, mm -hmm. and, and how they ever got uh, found us. Yeah. But they always did. <laughs> <laughs> so we left, I think. Thanksgiving or the day before Thanksgiving from uh, Naples at about 1,500 uh, 
guys being transferred home and plus a skeleton Navy crew. And uh, uh, after we got into the uh, to Atlantic from the uh, Mediterranean, we got in uh, tremendous storms. Uh, in fact, the, uh, the weather was so bad that the Navy guys were getting seasick. You can imagine what happened to, to us who weren't used to that. And uh, uh, I, I lived on apples for, it was a six day trip. And of course an aircraft carrier is top heavy. So it rolled like this instead of up and down. And I don't know which is worse, but uh, uh, we it, uh, one night in the storm was so bad that we rolled over on a 45 degree angle that we were told the next day whether they were just trying to kid us or not. I don't. Had it rolled 48 degrees, we would have capsized, uh, and that <laughs> brought the fear of God. <laughs> yeah. uh, but uh, it's like, did you did you have a thought at that point, like, you know, I. <laughs> I went through combat in Italy and on the way back home. Yeah, yeah and didn't make it home because, <laughs> I, and uh, uh, in fact, uh, I would, uh, we were assigned eating times and stuff, and guys would go down to eat. And of course, the Navy's food was much better than the Army food. And you'd get down in this big hole where they stored airplanes. And which is where the dining room was. And you'd stand in that line and guys would start throwing up all around you. And about the time you got to where you could smell the food, all of a sudden you wanted to throw up. And I would grab an apple, take it back to my bunk, crawl on my bunk, eat an apple. And that's what I lived on for, for five days. Oh. <laughs> uh, we came back, landed at uh, Hampton Roads, North, uh, South Carolina, North Carolina, and uh, where we'd started from some uh, almost two years before. Uh, I was there just a day or so, and uh, they uh, took all my old clothes, gave me new uniform, new shoes, everything, and uh, sent me to uh, uh, Indian Town Gap, Pennsylvania, which was uh, where they uh, separated you from the service, and give it a bus ticket and uh, whatever back pay I had, and I was out of the Army. And the, the day was that I was discharged was December 7th, 1945, four years from the day of Pearl, Pearl Harbor. So it was very easy to remember uh, when, when I was discharged. So, do you remember the first night you laid in bed after you got home? No, I don't. Uh, I remember I, my bedroom was waiting for me, and I think all my old clothes were still in the closet and things like that. But I don't remember, uh, you know, what we had to eat or anything like that. I was, I was just home. Yeah. Uh, I had one of, the, uh, one of the girls that I had been writing to that I actually thought was one that was going to end up with. Uh, after I'd been home about a month, I uh, went to Pittsburgh. She was uh, uh, in a nurse's training and uh, went to see her, took her out for, for dinner. Mm -hmm. And the only thing I can remember about that dinner is my stomach was still because all the time we were on the line, most, almost all the time, we were eating either K, K rations or C rations. And I think my stomach was just so reduced in size. And I went to a nice restaurant, good hot meal, and, and it just made me, I had to get up and go out and throw up. And, uh, and uh, I, uh, I have no idea. In fact, I was trying to think the other day. Because uh, I thought when I come home, I, I'd go back and uh, that would be the girl. Went back, saw her one time. I don't know what happened. I don't don't have any recollection whether she had found somebody else or we just decided that wasn't it. My 
family was living in the central part of Pennsylvania, and she was in Pittsburgh. Uh, I, I don't know what happened. <laughs> it ended. <laughs> it ended. <laughs>